Gentlemen, at this stage, I would urge you to reconsider. Never. Then take your place. It was a cold grey morning in 1809 when Viscount Robert Stuart Castlereagh and George Canning fought a duel due to Canning's criticism of Castlereagh's handling of the war against Napoleon Bonaparte. As Minister of War, Canning's criticism of the Foreign Secretary, Lord Castlereagh, led to a schism, the breadth of which increased when Canning attempted to dislodge the ailing Portsmouth with Pitt's brother, the Earl of Chatham. The ensuing duel finished the careers of the Prime Minister and Castlereagh and Canning for a time. There was always an anti-war party in Britain, just as there was a pro-war party, and each of these two represent one side or the other side. There were many people that felt that if you just conciliated Napoleon, he wouldn't be too difficult, he wouldn't carry on fighting. These events led to the ascension of Spencer Percival to the office of First Lord of the Treasury, Previously holding the posts of Solicitor General and Chancellor of the Exchequer, he was now the only man thought capable of taking up the mantle of Prime Minister. And so it was in May of 1809 that he was called upon by the King to accept this office of state. When a letter addressed to the Marquis of Wellesley arrived at the Foreign Office from a man calling himself John Bellingham, it was perhaps not surprising that the view was taken that the contents referring to his imprisonment in Russia was something of a minor affair in consideration of world events, and in particular Britain's relationship with the Russian Empire at that time. It received the curtest of official responses from Wellesley's private secretary, Culling Smith. His Majesty's Government is precluded from interfering in the support of your case in some measure by the circumstances of the case itself, and entirely so at the present moment, by the suspension of intercourse with the Court of St. Petersburg. Well, curt by 19th century standards. Bellingham's second petition was at least as unsuccessful. To the Right Honourable the Lords Commissioners of His Majesty's Treasury, my mercantile existence has been totally annihilated, and I am now with a family involved in ruin. The suspension of intercourse between Britain and Russia is no excuse to deny me redress. A week later, he was informed by the Privy Council... It is not a matter in which their lordships can in any manner interfere. By the time the third petition reached the office of the then Chancellor of the Exchequer, Spencer Percival, the official tone was getting rather predictable. Thomas Brookbank, private secretary to Percival, replied that the time for presenting private petitions has long since passed, and that Mr. Percival thinks it is not of a nature for the consideration of Parliament. This seemingly insignificant, if tedious, correspondence continued between Bellingham and various departments of state for another three years, during which time Percival was elevated to the position of PM due to his predecessor Lord Portland's illness. With Canning and Castlereagh out of the running, and Pitt's demise a number of years earlier, everyone agreed Percival was the only possible successor. It was a time of considerable agitation. The measures taken by Percival's administration in its financial conduct of the war created great hardship. Percival was called upon to defend his government's actions on countless occasions, not least upon the vexed question of parliamentary reform. Within Pitt's desire to hold all the various factions of his administration together, he'd allowed several policies to fall by the wayside. Perhaps the three most significant were, with the benefit of hindsight, the abolition of slavery, emancipation for Ireland, and reform of parliamentary procedure. Now the incumbent Prime Minister was forced to oppose another proposed bill of reform from Baronet Sir Francis Burdett. His response was typical as a member of the anti-reform lobby. The object of the Honourable Baronet appears to be that the House should give a pledge that it would, early in the next session, go into a committee on the state of the representation. I see no reason whatever for entering upon the question of reform at all, and therefore cannot agree to vote for any such pledge. 
In many propositions stated by the Honourable Baronet, I was unable to follow him. Among other things, he assumes it as a fact that the people were, in general, desirous of a reform. This proposition I absolutely reject. On the contrary, the people appear more united against reform than any other question because they deem it unnecessary. I admit, in the company the Right Honourable Baronet is generally associated with, the temper is for reform and would willingly pass such a resolution. But these individuals' views in no way reflect the majority. I am somewhat at a loss as to what the Right Honourable Gentleman proposes, as he has stated all he wants is stated in the statutes of the land. But what can be found there to justify the destruction of the ordinary practice of the Constitution? The statutes are explicit with regards to representation. I might also ask what he suggests will be done with respect to the privileges of the House. The right of originating tax belongs to the House at present, by practice of the Constitution, although not confirmed by any express statute. The events surrounding Bellingham's association with Percival and the legislation and legal system of the early 1800s have recently been re-examined by eminent historian Dr Judith Rowe Botham in her capacity as director of the academic research project Bad Behaviour and Socially Visible Crime, launched at Nottingham Trent University last year. She gives her opinion on the parliamentary reform debate in which Percival was currently embroiled. I think you've got to see the anti-reform lobby at this time as very much a product of contemporary fears because there'd been demands for parliamentary reform certainly since the 1760s and I think that the case was being reasonably successfully made by the late 1780s. Then you have the French Revolution and you have to remember that one of the things again that the British saw was parliamentary reform happening in France. What happens when you have parliamentary reform? You have revolution. So all of a sudden, the wider sympathy that had begun to develop for parliamentary reform begins to disappear. So it's not exactly surprising that Spencer Percival is anti-parliamentary reform. Meanwhile, Bellingham, frustrated in his attempt to gain satisfaction from a government he felt had so woefully abandoned him in his hour of need, was beginning to make strange and ill-defined threats about what he might do if he were not recompensed. I will bring it into a criminal court. His family, and in particular his patient and long-suffering wife, Mary, was unimpressed. We never gave any credit to it. Bellingham was determined to make clear he was not to be trifled with, and brought Mary and his cousin Anne to the Secretary of State's office. Mr Culling Smith agreed to see the party, probably because he did not wish to cause offence to the two ladies. Sir, my friends say I'm out of my senses. Is it your opinion, Mr Smith, that I am so? It's a very delicate question for me to answer. I only know you upon this business, and I can assure you that you will never have what you are pursuing after. Mr Smith's tact did not alleviate the intense embarrassment of this exchange for the two ladies, and Mary, who was at her wit's end with her husband, was beginning to regret a decision she had made earlier. When this business of John started with his obsession about the government, I felt I would not live with him until he made a solemn promise to give up wrong thoughts of these wild goose schemes and expectations. However, I was persuaded by my Uncle James, who said I should live with this, as I had taken him for better or worse. Mary's ultimatum did eventually produce the desired effect. The family returned to Liverpool, and John settled down to restoring his business and being a loving husband and father. Mary continued her millinery business with her partner Mary Stevens. The whole affair was never brought up, and for a time it seemed that Mary's best wishes were granted. Yet, in December 1811, Bellingham travelled to London. 18th of January, 1812. Your letter I received in course, and I'm glad to relieve your anxiety regarding darling Henry, who is wonderfully recovered and has cut two teeth. I feel most obliged by your attention in regard to our business, but must request you to call again at Phillips and Davison's, as it is their traveller's mistake and not any fault of ours. I feel very much surprised at your not mentioning any time for your return. You will be three weeks gone on Thursday, 
and you know I cannot do anything with regard to settling this business until your return. We have got in very little money since you left. I think I need not instruct you to act with economy. Your feeling for your family will induce you to it. I request you to write by return of post. The children send dear papa an affectionate kiss and one from mamma. And I remain yours very affectionately, Mary Bellingham. Oh, P.S. Pray let me know when you intend to return. Miss Stevens desires to be remembered. Of course, John Bellingham had no intention of returning soon. This was not a brief visit. He was determined to settle the outstanding complaint with the government, as the matter had not even been discussed with his family in the past months. Due to the disquiet his obsession was causing, he had brooded on his grievance alone and become even more obdurate and myopic. Bellingham's tone was still as ever polite and formal when receiving the usual replies in the negative, and his patience seemed inexhaustible. February 18th, 1812, I am directed to acquaint you that your petition to His Royal Highness the Prince Regent has been referred by the command of His Royal Highness for the consideration of the Lords of His Majesty's Most Honourable Privy Council. I am, sir, your most obedient humble servant. Along with Dr Judith Robotham, the largely forgotten historical events regarding Bellingham and Percival's administration have also been researched extensively by legal expert Judge David Bentley who describes the Foreign Office view of John Bellingham at that time. Bellingham was already well known to the uh, Foreign Office by the time of this assassination and was widely regarded in uh, official circles as a nuisance, a man who'd been locked up in Russia. Uh, the official view was that it was his own fault, it was his own dishonesty that had got him locked up. Uh, and indeed the uh, ambassador to St. Petersburg was uh, uh, to write after Bellingham's execution rebutting his charges that the embassy hadn't uh, come to his assistance, saying that uh, his imprisonment was uh, effectively due to his own crime. And uh, the, the trouble with Bellingham was that he would not go away. 20th of March 1812, I am directed to acknowledge the receipt of your letter requesting permission to present your petition to the House of Commons. And in reply, I am to acquaint you that you should redress your application to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. If there was a single point at which Bellingham's obsession took on a more sinister attitude, it may have been after receiving this reply from the Under Secretary John Beckett, directing him to address his petition to the very same office that had refused his petition two years ago, when Spencer Percival was then in that office. However, Bellingham would still not accept defeat, so he tried a different tack. 23rd of March 1812. To their worships the police magistrates of the public office in Bow Street. Sirs, I much regret it being my lot to have to apply to your worships under most peculiar and novel circumstances. For the particulars of the case I refer to the enclosed letter from Mr Secretary Ryder, the notification from Mr Percival and my petition to Parliament together with the printed papers herewith. The affair requires no further remark than that I consider His Majesty's Government have completely endeavoured to close the door of justice in declining to have or even permit my grievances to be brought before Parliament for redress, which privileges the birthright of every individual. The purpose of the present is therefore once more to solicit His Majesty's Ministers, through your medium, to let what is right and proper be done in my instance, which is all I require. Should this reasonable request be finally denied, I shall feel justified in executing justice myself. In which case, I shall be ready to argue the merits of so reluctant a measure with His Majesty's Attorney General wherever and whenever I shall be called upon to do so. In the hopes of averting so abhorrent but compulsive an alternative, I have the honour to be John Bellingham. It must be stated that for a man so absorbed in his own affairs, Bellingham's tact and courtesy was unusual and it seemed to him that if he made it clear that he had left no stone unturned, his final act of desperation would somehow be understood by those who would come to judge him. So again he tried formal channels. First with the member for Liverpool, General Gascoigne, and following no useful advice from him, he tried the Treasury Office. One can detect a note of patient weariness in the Treasury's minute book, written in by Treasury clerks, who were no doubt growing all too familiar with the case. Read two letters from Mr John Bellingham, dated 9th and 26th, 1812. 
together with his petition claiming redress from HM's government on account of the losses and sufferings experienced by him in consequence of some criminal proceedings instituted against him and arising out of mercantile transactions in Russia in 1804 and subsequent years. Transmit the papers to Mr Cook and desire he will submit the same to the consideration of Lord Castlereagh and move his lordship to favour this board with his opinion whether the circumstances of this case are such as would warrant the interpretation of HM's government in the manner suggested by the memorialist or in any other mode. Treasury Minute, 5th of May. Read letter from the Under Secretary of State, Mr Cook, dated the 29th, on the petition of Mr Bellingham claiming relief on account of certain losses and sufferings. Alleged to have been experienced by him in consequence of some criminal proceedings instituted against him by the Government of Russia in the year 1804, wherein Mr Cook states by direction of Lord Castlereagh that it appears upon reference to the papers in his Lordship's department that detailed particulars of Mr Bellingham's case were submitted for the consideration of the Marquis Wellesley in 1809, and by a minute attached to this statement, enclosed, that a communication was had with Mr Stewart, Secretary to Lord G. L. Gower in 1804, and afterwards H.M.'s minister at St. Petersburg, and with Sir Stephen Sherp, late British Consul General in Russia, who are well acquainted with the circumstances of the case. Writes to Mr. Bellingham, acquainting him that upon a reference to His Majesty's Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, it does not appear that this government could interfere in his case, even if this country were in amity with Russia. Bellingham never received the reply. But in any case, he had clearly decided on his next course of action, following the communication from John Beckett, to take his petition to the Chancellor of the Exchequer's office. Bellingham visited the office of the Secretary of State and spoke to a Mr Hill. At this meeting, he announced his intention to take his own form of justice, and the only reply the nonchalant Hill could muster, obviously accustomed to hearing histrionics of this sort from disappointed petitioners, was that Bellingham was at liberty to take such measures as he thought proper. No doubt Bellingham was assured that his actions would be understood having been given carte blanche from an official. Percival's time in the role of Prime Minister had not been smooth. In addition to running the war against Bonaparte and the unrest his harsh financial measures were creating, he was in fact single-handedly managing the economy, as no candidate had been found to fill the post of Chancellor of the Exchequer. He had a constitutional crisis, as the King finally lost his senses for good in 1811 and the regent, an unpopular man, was not accepted with alacrity by many of those both involved in the running of the country and the general public alike. In addition to these problems, he had a party that contained so many significant and sizeable personalities, such as Canning, Castlereagh, Sidmouth and Wellesley, that his administration was not as buoyant as it should be. Draft letter, Mr Percival to Lord Castlereagh, close of session 23rd of August 1810, to ask if he would come back with Canning as First Lord of the Admiralty or Home Secretary. My dear Lord, when you learn that the object of this letter is to ascertain what to chance there may be of your being prevailed upon to accept an office in the present government, you will easily conceive how much I must regret that I did not find myself prepared to open this subject to you before you left the neighbourhood of London. To make this mode of communication, however, which is the only one now open to me, as little defective and as satisfactory as possible, I shall think it necessary to explain fully what has been the course of my own thoughts, and these of my colleagues, upon this subject, as well as to state to you what has been done in consequence. Lord Sidmouth, yourself and Canning were the three heads of parties to alone we could be looking, and if you considered nothing but the relative strength of your respective connections, it would have been obvious that the application to any of you, with probable effect of alienating the other two, would not promise us any advantage, whilst the most desirable thing upon every account appeared to be the prevailing upon you all, if possible, to join us. As the letter shows, it took some considerable effort to draw these disparate forces into a degree of alignment, and the individuals concerned were hardly supported foundations on which to run a stable Tory government. This, of course, was not unique to Spencer Percival's administration. It was a characteristic of government at the time that different heads of department would act independently from one another, and even from the PM, collective responsibility being something of the future. Dr Judith Robotham. Successful politics in those days was more about the management of different interest groups, and those interest groups represented kinship groups, friendship groups, 
links developed through money interests, but also marriages, a whole range of things like that, which had less to do with particular political themes in many ways than, as I say, advancing the interests of particular groups. And Percival was at a disadvantage because he was not a powerful independent figure with a huge amount of links and patronage at his dispensation. Any successful government on the, in inverted commas, conservative side was going to need at least some of the Canning Party and at least some of the Castlereagh Party to be successful. And there was no way that Castlereagh could have headed a government and brought in Canning. There was no way that Canning could have headed a government and brought in Castlereagh. So Percival, in a sense, is the compromise between the two, which puts him at a real disadvantage between the two most dominant, the two most powerful groups within the British Parliament at that time. Any politically minded individual then would have perhaps understood the limited relevance the government placed on Bellingham's rather small affair. Yet, in a few months, it was to alter the country's history in an abrupt and shocking manner. Good morning, Mr Taylor. I thought I'd place that order with you, the one I mentioned yesterday when we met in Guildford Street. Oh yes, I remember it's... He gave me directions to make him an inside pocket on the left side so as he could get at it conveniently. He wished to have it a particular depth. Uh, he accordingly gave me a bit of paper about the length of nine inches. On the 6th of May, 1812, Mary Bellingham's friend and business partner, Mary Stevens, arrived in London. She was to be assisted by John regarding the millinery business she and his wife owned. She was also there to express his wife's deep displeasure at his continued obsession with the government's wrongs. However, he was as implacable as ever. On the 11th, he saw Miss Stevens to deliver letters he wished her to take on her return to Liverpool. If there should be a new ministry, would it not retard your concerns? Would it not be better to relinquish it than to oppose the powerful so much? I will not. If ministers refuse to do me justice, I will do it myself. You do not know, Miss Stevens, what I have endured the last six months. I would rather commit suicide. God forbid you should commit such an act. Your countenance shows what you must have suffered. But how are you to obtain this? I will bring it into a criminal court. Mr Spencer Percival? Yes, sir. Pray, how may I help you? Uh, sir, the Secretary of the Treasury has asked me to inform you of an urgent request by the Right Honourable Sir Henry Brown, Member for Camelford, for your attendance at the House, as it sits in committee of the whole House presently and requires your immediate attention. Oh, yes, you are quite right. I am unfortunately late. Please convey my respects to the Secretary, and I shall delay no longer. I shall apologise to the Member for Camelford presently. It must be pointed out that the title a committee of the whole house can be misleading. It suggests that those cramped corridors would be brimming over with MPs in every corner. In fact, on this day, only 60 out of the 650 members were present. And at this point, Percival was not among them. Honestly, who does he think he is? Henry Broom. This is the second occasion the man has failed to turn up to this committee. Mark my words, this matter will not go away simply by his lack of attendance. Next time I won't just complain to you, sir, I will make it a matter of censure. On this evening, the 11th of May 1812, Brum's attempts to instigate a select committee on the Orders in Council had resulted in a committee of the whole House. The Orders in Council, he claimed, had caused considerable distress to the working people of Britain and to the mercantile classes in particular. There was a feeling that Percival's government was bloodletting British interests in its prosecution of the war against Napoleon Bonaparte. The pattern of politics in the 18th century had been that if you were unhappy with events in the locality, you went off and had a little riot about bread prices or local taxes, rate taxes, things like that. And part of the political system was the accommodation, usually on a local level, that was reached between local government, local magistrates, local magnates, backed up by the militia, and the mob would disperse when some kind of conclusion had been reached. It was rare for there to be major violence. What was happening 
as a result of the Napoleonic Wars, well, starting with the French Revolutionary Wars and then going on into the Napoleonic Wars, is that all of a sudden these popular demonstrations took on, in the eyes of the government, a new and sinister dimension. The orders were, in fact, not his invention, but were imposed in 1807 by Broome's own party, the Whig administration, led at that time by Lord Grenville. Since then, the naval blockade, which was affecting neutral shipping and was created to counter the retaliatory measures of Bonaparte, was placing a considerable strain on commerce and trade in Britain. As Percival climbed the steps of the house, Broome had just finished examining his first witness, a potter from Stoke-on-Trent, and Mr James Stephen was launching into his cross-examination. Mr. Hamilton, you claim that the government's measures have caused you considerable hardship, but pray tell the House. Order! Order! Murder! Mr. Percival is shot! Mr. Percival is shot! I will bring it into a criminal court. If he had risen in a minute or afterwards and walked quietly out into the street, he would have escaped, and the committer of the murder would never have been known unless he had chosen to divulge it. You, you need not press me. I'll submit myself to justice. Someone arrived from the speaker's room with the doctor's verdict and stated, Mr. Percival is dead. Villain, how could you destroy so good a man and make a family of ten or twelve children orphans? To which Bellingham's answer was, I'm sorry for it. I am the unfortunate man. I wish I were in Mr. Percival's place. My name is John Bellingham. It is a private injury. I know what I have done. It was a denial of justice on the part of the government. One gets that impression about Bellingham, that he's somebody who could, uh, 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 once he got a deluded uh, idea in his mind, allow it to um, really take uh, precedence over everything. I mean, hence the fact that he seems to have thought uh, very little of killing Spencer Percival. He seems to have taken the view that that was entirely justified in the circumstances, which might not have struck everybody as, as, as entirely right, even, even if the facts were as Bellingham thought them to be. To set this event in context, one is minded to remember that Britain had only just recently lost its possessions in America. The stories of Republican bloodlust after the 1789 revolution in France were still fresh in the minds of British politicians. There was a strong sentiment in the land for revolution, anti-disestablishmentarianism and even parliamentary reform. Therefore, this seemingly motiveless act was initially believed to be part of some greater revolutionary design, carried along by the ferment of the times. There was undoubtedly a feeling that political doom was just round the corner. Again, you have to consider, from the British perspective, they saw just how small the beginnings of the French Revolution had been. A little bit of disturbance and what happens is revolution. It's easy for us now with hindsight to see how the cause of the French Revolution is not in fact the storming of the Bastille that is almost a minor trigger event. That you're talking about a collapse coming from an implosion of a whole range of other issues in France. The rise of the middle class, the economic collapse, the after effects of the highly expensive French involvement in the American War of Independence, which enabled France to give Britain a beautiful bloody nose, but my goodness, they paid for it later. All those kinds of issues. It was a mixture of economic and social and cultural tensions. But, of course, people in Britain didn't see it that way at the time. What they saw, as is stressed later in Carlyle's history of the French Revolution, is the collapse of one of the most stable powers in the Western world. If it could happen to France, why wasn't it going to happen to Britain? Indeed, for a brief moment it appeared that the restless multitude were convulsed into seditious libel and dissemblers revelled in what was believed to be the parting of the waves. The Nottingham Journal, Tuesday 12th of May 1812. We're sorry to observe that a strong disposition to tumult prevailed in this town on Tuesday evening last. As soon as the truth of the report respecting the murder of Mr Percival had been ascertained, a few deluded men and ignorant boys who had been taught to believe that the gentleman was the prime cause of all our commercial distresses and sufferings among the people at the present time, assembled in the neighbourhood of Fishergate and proceeded with a band of music all through the principal streets. They were soon joined by a numerous rabble who, in the most indecent and reprehensible manner, testified their joy at the horrid catastrophe by repeated shouts, the firing of guns, and every species of exultation. 
It's very easy to say that what was at the heart of the assassination was a private grievance. It was an individual resentment, but it represented the ways in which the patronage system that had bound society together in the 18th century and earlier was simply coming unglued. There was now no reliance that patronage was working. And a lot of people felt themselves aggrieved because unjustly excluded from access to the kinds of perks that they had almost taken for granted. There were a lot of people who felt aggrieved because they didn't think they would ever have any chance to access individuals and get those kinds of perks. So yes, there was a huge amount of resentment going on. The government knew that, and undoubtedly they wished to make an example, like a hanging poor old Admiral Bing, pour encourager les autres, Bellingham, I think, uh, suffered from much the same kind of spirit. Such spectacles were repeated in several parts of the country, but mainly in the areas who suffered most from the government's stern economic measures. Few, if any, resulted in significant violence. The occasional skirmish was the worst of it. And although the riot act was read and a military presence was kept visible, there was no tide of revolution. And as the facts of Bellingham's case were disseminated over the following weeks, it was realised this was a strange and macabre action brought about by the idiosyncrasies of the individual concerned. Bellingham himself had been most vociferous regarding his reasons for killing Percival. He rationalised it as being necessary to achieve his rightful ends, and was quite happy to go on record saying so. Like so many other acts of protest, the act itself had overshadowed his cause. Bellingham, however, was too single-minded to recognise this. It was as if all his life he had been a pistol, primed and ready to take aim, simply waiting for the target to avail itself. Now it appeared he believed he had immunity from his actions. It was as if the action was so desperate that people must see he had no other recourse. Within hours of the assassination, magistrates were attending on the commons and a preliminary committal hearing took place in which uh, depositions were taken from principal witnesses and Bellingham was asked uh, if he had anything that he wanted to say in answer to the charge, cautioned as prisoners always were that he'd be better advised to say nothing. But Bellingham wouldn't keep quiet and he made it perfectly clear that he knew what he'd done, that it was deliberate and what his reasons were. And that was to make it far easier in my judgment, to hurry him on to trial and brush aside his counsel's uh, pleas that there be a postponement so that witnesses could be called to uh, prove his, uh, his insanity. My memorial then has at last gone forth into the world. The public now will be able to judge my case and do me the justice to say I have only done my duty. They can do me no harm, for the government has cause to fear. At 10 o'clock on the morning of the 15th of May 1812, the trial of John Bellingham began. The immense public interest in the case was fueled by speculative reports in the newspapers regarding the assailant. Strange tales regarding his amorous behaviour abroad seemed to be responsible for a great many well-dressed young ladies surrounding Newgate that morning. One of the factors which it's important not to overlook in Bellingham's case, and the position very different today, is there was no protection in Bellingham's time worth talking of against pre-trial publicity. Today, there can be no reporting of the committal hearing. As far as Bellingham was concerned, the Times, the following day after he'd been examined uh, in the House of Commons, uh, was publishing in full what all the witnesses had said and what Bellingham had to say. And the papers were full of uh, as much as their detail as they'd been able to gather about his history, uh, character assassination. Uh, this, this was something which newspapers regularly went in for against unpopular criminals. And by the time they came to trial, the jury knew what the allegations against them were, knew a lot about their history, and if they'd been previously convicted in the past, the press would have no hesitation in telling the jury about it. And all that the law could do is have the judge direct the jury to put out of their minds anything that they may have read about this case in the press. In an attempt to curb the public's insatiable curiosity that might have led to an overcrowded court, the Crown decided that only those persons who made a written application to the court would be allowed into the public gallery. However well meant this measure was, it made very little impact. 
and reports spread amongst those who were interested in attending that a guinea charge on the door to the doorkeepers would guarantee admission. By 10, when Newgate was encircled by 2,000 people, the price had risen to three guineas. Bellingham, when woken, at first appeared calm to his jailers, but he could not hold down his breakfast, and in the course of the morning's proceedings burst into tears. By the time he was brought through the corridors of his prison to the Sessions House, he was once again composed, and apparently oblivious to all the commotion he had single-handedly managed to create. There was a look of horror on the faces of those who stared at this dark night. However, there were some who were only too ready to suggest the legal proceedings against him were far from judicious and lacked true objectivity, not least because of their political motivations rather than a concern for the prisoner himself. Looking back on the events, Percival's old sparring partner on the orders in council, Lord Broom, was to remark, The greatest disgrace to English justice. Sitting in judgment was the Lord Mayor, the Duke of Clarence, the Lord Chief Justice of the Common Pleas, Sir James Mansfield, the Recorder, Baron Sir Robert Graham, and Mr Justice Sir Nash Gross. Representing the Crown was Attorney General Sir Vickery Gibbs, commonly known as Vinegar Gibbs, due to his terse manner. He had a team of four assisting him. His opposite numbers were Peter Alley and Henry Revel Reynolds. Almost immediately, the proceedings descended into confusion. The defence requested a postponement. Mr. Alley, my lord, the, the defence would ask most earnestly if your lordship would grant us an application to have these hearings postponed. This request is founded upon statements which would go to show the sanity of the defendant is in question, provided we have time in order to prepare and call witnesses to this effect. Yes, Sir Vickery. My lord, it is necessary that the prisoner should be called on in the first place to say whether he be guilty or not guilty. My lord, I cannot hear any person as counsel may be called to assist him. We are not to know at present that the prisoner has any counsel. Nor even that the prisoner is the man referred to in the indictment. Bellingham made his very first address to the nation via his pledge of innocence. He had very little time to prepare his defence. I mean, one of the first things that he asked for um, was that he have his documents. Uh, and he eventually got them, but only when he was about to embark on his defence, when he'd had no real opportunity to... Uh, sort them or to uh, digest their contents or uh, to construct uh, an argument based on them. My lords, before I can plead to this indictment, I must state, in justice to myself, that by the hurrying on of my own trial, I am in place in a most remarkable situation. It so happens that my prosecutors are actually the witnesses against me. All the documents on which alone I could rest my defence have been taken from me and are now in the possession of the Crown. It is only two days since I was told by Mr Litchfield, the Solicitor of the Treasury, to prepare my trial. And when I asked him for my papers, he told me that they would not be given up to me. It is, therefore, my lords, rendered utterly impossible for me to go into my justification. And under the circumstance in which I find myself, a trial is absolutely useless. The papers are to be given to me after the trial. But how can that avail me for my defence? I'm therefore not ready for my trial. Well, I think they've no doubt seized his papers because they wanted to inquire as deeply as they could into this assassination. I mean, at the same time, the committal hearing was taking place in the House of Commons before uh, magistrates. Uh, steps were also being taken to make inquiries about Bellingham and his, his associates to see if this assassination was not part of some wider scheme. In fact, it all seems to have established that this was just Bellingham's private grievance which um, was finding expression and not part of a, a wider scheme. But that was something that was, was certainly being investigated. I'm sure that's why they wanted to hold on to the papers. Before the indignant Attorney General could leap into the breach in defence of these actions, the Chief Justice asked whether the defendant had actually pleaded. He received his reply. Not guilty. I put myself upon God and my country. No sooner had Bellingham pronounced his innocence, the Attorney General then began explaining that for the purposes of justice, Bellingham's papers had been withheld, but that Bellingham's solicitor need only apply for the copies of the documents and they would have been furnished with this evidence they deemed so vital. A statement to which Mr Alley replied, It was only yesterday that Mr Reynolds and I were applied to. Until today I had never seen the prisoner before. Alley then went on to offer two affidavits regarding the sanity of the prisoner. One from a Mrs Mary Clark and another from John's cousin Anne Billet. They described their knowledge of the prisoner over several years and the early signs of derangement he seemingly displayed. 
Ali then went on to push for an adjournment. My lord, it was only on Monday that the alleged act was said to have been perpetrated. A letter could not have been sent to Liverpool to the next day, and it was impossible that any answer could since have been received. Even where a person was to be tried in the town in which he usually resided, some time must be necessary to enable him to provide for his trial. It appears that this is clearly a contrivance to delay the administration of justice, and that these witnesses are purposefully selected to impose upon the court a false belief regarding their knowledge of the prisoner's sanity. Where has the prisoner been for these four months preceding this act, for which he is this day called to answer? Has Mrs. Billet or Mrs. Clark seen him during this period, so as to witness his conduct? No, my lords, he has been resident in this town, in the midst of a family known to multitudes of persons in this town, transacting business in this town, and with much sagacity and as perfect and masculine an understanding as any man who hears me now. It appears that the Attorney General was attempting to try the case before a legal decision had been made, and he went on to attack the proposed and only defence of poor Mr Bellingham. None of these persons come before you to give an account of his state of mind. None of those who can know the fact come forward to state their knowledge of it. It is evidently a contrivance set up by a woman in Southampton and another woman living in this city, whose means of communication with the prisoner does not appear. It is only they who pretend that he is an unsound state of mind. But neither of them have attempted to swear that he was in an infirm state of mind about the time that the crime was committed. Later on in the course of the trial, the defence would call the two unfortunate ladies, who received the most bruising of cross-examinations. Can you state any period for a month, a week, or a single day he was ever restrained? No. Has he been left to act upon his own will as much as me or anybody else? Yes, I believe he was. After your visit to Mr Smith at the Secretary of State's office, he remained in town. And after that, neither you nor his wife gave any intimation to Mr Smith that he was a deranged man or any officers of government? No. How long is it since you saw him? More than 12 months ago. Did you ever know him confined for a single day? No. After discrediting any evidence that Anne Billet may have attempted to give on the part of her beloved John, Gibbs then called Mary Clark in order to further establish the competence of John Bellingham. So he came up from Liverpool to London. He came up alone? Yes, he came up alone, to the best of my knowledge. He told me that he was come on business. He transacted business for himself then, did he not? I do not know anything about his business. You do not know anybody that transacted business for him, do you? No, I heard he was confined in Russia. Yes, but for all that, he was suffered to go about here, in this country. I do not know of any control over him. Or do you know of any medical person being consulted about him? No, I do not know. You do not know of any precautions that were taken to prevent him from squandering his property in this state of derangement, do you? I do not know. You do not know of any course pursued to him by his friends that would not be pursued to any rational man? I do not. The aptly named Vinegar Gibbs went on pouring vitriolic scorn on the suggestion of Bellingham's insanity by pointing out that the defence, had they wished to establish this fact, surely would have gone to the trouble of obtaining expertise in such matters of mental health. In actual fact, Messrs Alley and Reynolds had done just that by writing to two of the leading experts in this field. Both men had previously been in attendance to George III. One of these was willing to appear, but could not do so on the first day of the trial. The other had not yet replied. These protestations from the defence were of little consequence, however. Judge David Bentley. The test which uh, Mansfield told the jury to apply in Bellingham's case it isn't really markedly different from that which is laid down in McNaughton's case, namely, did Bellingham uh, know the difference between right and wrong, and did he know that the act he'd committed was a crime under law? And if the answer to both those questions is yes, whatever his mental condition, he is sane uh, for legal purposes. And it was on that basis that Mansfield refused a postponement, saying, I've read these affidavits, and uh, if every word that the doctors say is true, uh, it still doesn't mean that uh, he wasn't sane at the time that he did what he did. And I think where Bellingham probably cooked his goose 
was in the committal hearing at the House of Commons before the city magistrates when the depositions were taken and instead of keeping his mouth shut he couldn't uh, keep silent, he had to talk about his grievances and he said enough to make his listeners realise that he knew what he'd done and he knew the difference between right and wrong and that he knew it was a crime. And I think that's why Mansfield refused the postponement, saying, well, you, you call all these doctors and it still will not avail him at all. If there were proper grounds advanced for postponing the trial, I would coincide with the application. But no such grounds could be discovered in these affidavits. Their silence as to the prisoner's conduct in London and to his demeanour in the months, nay, years past, make them inadmissible. The first spoke of Liverpool as the prisoner's established residence. The second related to his return from Russia two years ago. Now, could it be supposed that he went, or would be permitted to go to Russia if he were in a disordered state of mind? With this legal argument quashed, the state began its case. Again, Gibbs chiselled away at the only defence of Bellingham's behaviour, his mental state. With regards to the previous life the prisoner had led, I had nothing to do with it except insofar as it was concerned with the present prosecution. The prisoner was a merchant. He was in business for himself, and had showed that he was a man of sense, capable not only of carrying on his own business, but that he was even employed in conducting the business of others. There was never any idea of any taint or blemish in his capacity in this respect. Gibbs wisely chose to miss out the facts of Bellingham's bankruptcy. There was no pretense for supposing the prisoner to be what in law is termed non compus mentis. He managed not only his own affairs, but also the affairs of others. And there was not the slightest pretense or suspicion that his mind was not perfectly sound and right. Now, as to the nature of criminal rather than civil incapacity, the jury is to understand that a man might be in such a state of incapacity as to be inadequate to the management of his own affairs, or might even have the management of them taken out of his hands. But a person so situated was not thereby discharged from his criminal acts. A man, though incapable of conducting his civil affairs, is equally liable, provided he has a mind capable of distinguishing between right and wrong. Here, there was no deficiency of understanding. The prisoner was not only capable of managing, and did actually manage his own affairs, but he managed the affairs of others. The question for the jury to consider in this case is whether the prisoner at the bar was, or was not, capable of distinguishing between right and wrong at the time when the crime for which he is now called on to answer was perpetrated by him. Criminologist Dr. Azrini Wadhidin from Leeds Metropolitan University describes the legal differences between diminished responsibility, a relatively recent legal concept, and a defence based on the grounds of insanity which was the only available defence covering mental health during this period. In relation to Bellingham's case, he would have been able to appeal via the kind of Human Rights Act and also under the kind of Criminal Justice Review Committee and also the European Court for Human Rights. It's interesting that Mansfield could have persuaded the jury to consider Bellingham under the Mental Health Act. There's certain terms he used. Um, he was acting out of character. He was under immense pressure, which then kind of led to a form of a, a obsession. The nature of the offence would have, in terms of the nature of the prison system now, taken him to one of the special hospitals, if not Brendan Green, to receive therapeutic treatment rather than just custodial. Numerous witnesses were assembled by the prosecution who dutifully trotted off their version of events, which clearly showed Bellingham's guilt. Eventually, it came time for the defence to present its case. The evidence being gone through on the part of the prosecution, now it is time for you to make any defence you have to offer to produce any witnesses that you wish to be examined. Mr Bellingham, did you hear me? The evidence being gone through on the part of the prosecution, now it is time for you to make any defence you have to offer to produce any witnesses that you wish to be examined. I'll leave it to my counsel, my lord. You may not. Your counsel is there to advise you on points of law and to question any witnesses you wish to bring forward. But otherwise, you must put your own defence to the jury. This, in fact, was not a peculiarity of this case, but of the age. Until 1837, when a law was enacted that stated all defendants must have counsel to represent them, it was incumbent on the accused to essentially defend themselves, normally to the considerable advantage of the Crown. Bellingham, however, 
had shown a considerable grasp in putting forward his arguments to the government in an articulate and legalistic fashion, which put the insanity defence of Allian Reynolds at something of a disadvantage. He demonstrated a clarity of thought regarding his actions which deflected attention from the disastrous, obsessive traits in his character. The common law rule was that in treason and felony a man was not entitled to counsel, save to argue a point of law. The reason that Cook gave for that was because the law demanded such a strict proof of guilt. The evidence must be so clear that a hundred lawyers uh, could not gainsay it. And various other justifications were offered. One suspects that one of the objections was that it was felt that lawyers would slow the whole proceedings down and that lawyers might be astute to find flaws in indictments which might carry a man to his acquittal. So Cook's answer may have been somewhat disingenuous. Now, by about the 1720s, the judges uh, had begun to allow accused to have counsel to ask questions on their behalf and to call witnesses on their behalf, but they would not permit counsel to address the jury on the accused's behalf. One of the reasons given for that was that if the jury saw the man speak himself, well, that would enable them, from his demeanour, to form uh, their own view as to the kind of man they were dealing with and as to his uh, uh, likely uh, truthfulness or otherwise. Uh, but much more important than that counsel uh, was allowed only to this limited extent is the fact that the vast majority of prisoners couldn't afford counsel and so went unrepresented. About uh, 80 to 90 percent of prisoners went unrepresented at this time. It's also quite usual for the Crown not to be represented by counsel. Bellingham's first action in his own defence was to request the copies of his correspondence and other papers. He hesitated for a moment whilst looking through the various documents, drew a short breath and began his incredible testimony which he believed would fully exonerate him of this crime. Gentlemen of the jury, I am under great obligations to the learned Attorney General for inducing the court to dismiss the objection that was made by my counsel on the grounds of insanity, because it is by far more fortunate for me that such a plea should be determined to be unfounded. At the same time, I must express my gratitude to my counsel, whose object was certainly most meritorious. That I am insane, I certainly am perfectly ignorant. And I assure you that I never had any idea of it, with the exception of one instance in Russia, where my insanity was made a matter of public notoriety. Gentlemen, I beg pardon for thus detaining you, but I am wholly unaccustomed to situations like the present, and this is the first time I ever addressed a public audience. I therefore hope to receive your candid indulgence, and trust that you will pay more attention to the matter detailed than to the manner in which it is delivered. Now he had a captive audience. Bellingham began to describe the endless, fruitless petitions to the government and of his own isolated torment, after which he explained the strange events that led to his present predicament. Do you suppose me the man to go with a deliberate design, without cause or provocation, with a pistol, to put an end to the life of Mr Percival? No, gentlemen, far otherwise. I have strong reasons for my conduct, however extraordinary. Reasons which, when I have concluded, you will acknowledge to have fully justified me in this fatal act. Had I not possessed these imperious excitements and had murdered him in cold blood, I should consider myself a monster, not only unfit to live in this world, but too wicked for all the torments that may be inflicted in the next. The question remained, however, who was John Bellingham and what extremity of situation had led to these absurd events where he, the killer, felt himself more unfortunate than the victim? It began with an anonymous letter to Lloyds of London the gist of which went something like this. Dear Sirs, it has come to my attention that your company has been advised of the loss of a Russian-owned ship, the Sojus, captained by a Mr Milray, in the White Sea in the year 1803. Your company has been assured that you are entirely liable for the amount to which the ship and cargo was insured. However, I feel it my duty to inform you that a gross fraud has been promulgated against your good selves. I urge your company to investigate the irregularities relating to the amounts to which the cargo is stated in this claim, and certain other forms of malpractice in the prosecution of this claim. The Russian owners of the Sejour, Solomon Van Brinen and Vasily Popov, were not entirely appreciative of this letter. 
as it ultimately resulted in their having to reimburse their losses by other means. Bellingham, whose work had taken him to Russia in connection with the house of R. Van Brienen and Sons, was immediately suspected by Van Brienen as the author of this disruptive document and decided to sue Bellingham for the amount of 38,000 rubles, which they wanted payable to a bankrupt to whom they were the sole assignees. Popov, who was the mayor of Archangel, where the company resided, and Van Brienen, a member of a wealthy merchant family, had considerable clout and on Bellingham's refusal to pay, had little difficulty in having the distressed Englishman tossed into jail, albeit briefly. On my arrival in Petersburg, what was it fit that I should do? What you or any man would have done under such circumstances? I felt myself injured in my fortune, and above all in my reputation. Should I not go to the Minister of Justice for the vindication of my honour? Count Kotspew had the affair investigated most of the departments at Archangel, and finding my statement accurate, he gave me a document which enabled me to bring my case before the Senate, that a full and fair investigation might take place. Just at that period, Lord Gower arrived and I put the papers in his hands, that they might be laid before the Senate. I continued with Mrs Bellingham during this time, she being then at St Petersburg, which I had then reached. Before the Senate, I produced my complaints, but before the decision was had, I found myself arrested on two charges, the one criminal and the other civil and I was dragged from my family, thrown again into prison, where I continued for no lesser space than two years. Bellingham did not exaggerate. For three tiresome years, he was shunted around the country, pestering British officials as they saw it, and being constantly rejected. It must be stated that the initial figure of 38,000 rubles was gradually reduced first to 4,890 rubles, and finally the figure settled upon was 2,000 rubles. Bellingham obstinately refused to pay any figure, perhaps understandably given his treatment. There was an unending correspondence, mostly in one direction, to British officials, the Duma, and even the Tsar himself. The relationship between Britain and Russia at this time was variable to say the least, and this seemingly inconsequential matter was a minor consideration. Dr Judith Robotham. My understanding is that we had no wish in Britain to drive Russia further into the arms of the French. The Russian Tsar at the time was notoriously touchy, and to give him offence for a little squirt like Bellingham did not exactly seem sensible. These were the trials that would bow the proudest head and sink the noblest heart. Think, gentlemen, what I endured. And what was my offence? Nothing. There was not the shadow of proof against me. It was falsehood from beginning to end. Yet this they call giving me justice. Ah, this, thank God, is not the way it is administered in this happy country. Gentlemen, I feel myself so much exhausted that I, I must beg for, to pause for a few seconds. Mr. Bellingham, remember where you are. Please be so good as to continue or to sit down. Gentlemen, thus was I thrown into a dungeon and into despair. The very day I expected a complete enfranchisement. The very hour I looked for a re-established honour and reviving fortunes, I was handed to another prison because I would not bow to the extortion of 2,000 rubles. At the start of Bellingham's troubles in 1804, whilst in Archangel, he had applied for a travelling pass which allowed him to travel to St. Petersburg to meet his wife. About to leave, this pass was revoked and whilst he was not actually imprisoned, he was harassed continuously by the authorities there. Then in 1805, he managed to obtain another pass. On his arrival in St. Petersburg, this was removed from his person by the police. This action he did not bear with silent contemplation. And after some badgering of the Governor-General, he had his pass returned. But worse was to come. All his documents, journals, books, in short, all his private papers, were taken from him by the authority of the Duma, and fresh charges were brought against him by Van Brienen. The Governor-General who had earlier cleared Bellingham of any indebtedness, now took a different view and reversed his earlier decision. And when, sometime in April of 1805, the British consul Sir Stephen Sherp requested information regarding the case, he was informed Bellingham's detention was entirely legal. I was dragged about the street with offenders who had been guilty of the most atrocious crimes. Of what must my heart have been composed? That was the sufferer of this indignity and this torture to the eternal disgrace of both nations. I applied to Sir Stephen Sherp, again without success. I was not listened to. I could obtain no redress there. 
I sought it here, in my native country. I have again been refused. My fortune and my character have been ruined, and I stand here alone and unprotected by all but the laws of my country. They, I trust, will afford me that which all others have denied. It was clear that the Governor-General's initial view of Bellingham's case was one where an injustice had been committed. Why then had he chosen to reject his original verdict and leave this man to the mercy of the Russian authorities, who were clearly biased in their administration of this affair? Certainly Bellingham saw the British authorities in St. Petersburg, and in particular the Governor-General, as the agents responsible for the death of Percival. All this could not have happened but by the contrivance of Lord L. Gower and Sir S. Shep during this period too. Mrs. Bellingham, in a state of pregnancy and one infant in her arms, was anxiously waiting for me to accompany her to England. I could not. And she was compelled to perform that dangerous voyage alone and unprotected, though in a condition so interesting, while Lord Gower saw and permitted so much misery. Oh my God, what must his heart be made of? Gentlemen, I appeal to you as men, as fathers, as Christians, if I had not cause of complaint. Although his protestations could never excuse his act, the government, due to his proximity with so many offices of state, albeit coming through his incessant correspondence, must have had cause to be a little embarrassed. They might have been happier if he had been a lunatic whose attack came completely out of the blue, rather than a lucid individual who practically warned them on countless occasions of his intentions, and in so doing gave them the opportunity to prevent his act of protest. Yet after all, they were obliged to give a document testifying that there was neither claimants nor creditors. These documents I afterwards placed in the hands of Marquis of Wellesley, and I call upon the noble Marquis, whom I see in the court, to disprove this assertion if it be false. Strangely, the noble Marquis did not accept Bellingham's invitation and remained silent. While I relate this, I must say it would have been fortunate for me, and it would have been more fortunate for Mr. Percival, had Lord Gower received the ball which terminated the life of the latter gentleman. If Bellingham had hoped to win over his audience, this was not the most propitious of remarks. Bellingham wanted it clear that this was no act of revenge, but of necessity, an argument that has often been cited after extreme acts of this nature. He then read a note, written by his victim. Are you finished, Mr. Bellingham? No, my lord, I'm not. I would like to read you a statement made by the victim in order that the jury may fully understand. I was informed that the time for receiving private petitions was passed for that session. Neither do I think Mr. Bellingham's claims, such as could with propriety, be submitted to Parliament. Now, with regard to private bills, I know there is a limited time for their reception. But I have yet to learn that a private petition imploring justice from the wisdom and integrity of Parliament could ever be out of time. Justice is a matter of right and not of favour, and as such, I think it should be dispensed at all times. If I'm wrong in this opinion, then there are many honourable members now present in the court who can correct me. Where can an injured subject appeal so justly as Parliament? And if that constitutional door be shut against him, where is his redress? By this refusal, I was again reduced to despair. My situation became daily and hourly worse. My property was all sold, my creditors were clamorous, my family was ruined, my mind was in a state of horror. So here was the crux of the matter, as far as Bellingham's tortured reasoning was concerned. Such, gentlemen, continued to be my forlorn condition. My prayers were rejected, whenever offered. I was sinking under the pressure of accumulated miseries. Miseries brought on, not by my own indiscretion, but by the injustice of others. The Attorney General has told you, and he has told you truly, that till this period my name, my character, was without a blemish. Till this melancholy, this deplorable transaction, which no man, I can solemnly assure you, laments more deeply than I do, till this fatal moment my life was without reproach, that my arm destroyed, I allow. That he perished by my hand, I admit. But to constitute felony, there must be malice perpense. There must be the willful intention, and I deny that it has been proved. Unless proved, however, the felony cannot be made out. This you will shortly hear from the bench, and in that case, you must acquit me. With that, he sat down. After the lambasting of Anne Billet and Mary Clark by Vickery Gibbs, Lord Mansfield then summed up with tears and histrionics that this court was not accustomed to. If a man fancied he was right, and in consequence conceived that if that fancy is not gratified, that he has a right to obtain justice by any means which his physical strength gave him, 
There is no knowing where so pernicious a doctrine might end. Some human creatures are void of all power of reasoning from birth, and as such could not be guilty of any crime. The single question was whether, at the time this fact was committed, he possessed a sufficient degree of understanding to distinguish good from evil, right from wrong, and whether murder was a crime not only against the law of God, but against the law of his country. Within less than 15 minutes, the foreman handed in their decision. That's not particularly uncommon. Indeed, um, it was quite usual for juries to bring back verdicts without even leaving the jury box. Although in the event that a jury took its time making its decision, there were a number of means by which the law put pressure on them. The rule at that time was that once a jury had um, retired to consider its verdict or had been asked to consider its verdict, it might not then separate. And indeed, the jurors from that time onwards were not entitled to food, drink or flame or heat. Um, until such time as they came back with their verdict. Foreman, please stand. Have you reached a verdict on which you are all agreed? We have. What is the verdict of you all? Guilty. Has the prisoner anything to say? Prisoner at the bar, you have been convicted by a most attentive and a most merciful jury of one of the most malicious and atrocious of crimes it is in the power of human nature to perpetuate. A crime which, although thus heinous in itself, in your case has been heightened by every possible feature of aggravation. You have shed the blood of a man admired for every virtue which can adorn public or private life. By his death, the country has lost one of its brightest ornaments, a man whose ability and worth was likely to produce lasting advantages to this empire and ultimately benefit to the world. Everyone would agree that Percival was an extremely capable man, but one might be forgiven in thinking this eulogy was over-egging the pudding slightly. Your impure hand has deprived of existence a man as universally beloved, as preeminent for his talents and excellence of heart. Assassination is most horrid and revolting to the soul of man, inasmuch as it is calculated to render bravery useless and cowardice successful. Your disgraced and indignant country, by the example of your ignominious fate, will appreciate the horror of your offence. Sincerely do I hope that the short interval that has elapsed since the commission of this atrocious offence has not been unemployed by you in soliciting that pardon from the Almighty which I trust your prayers may obtain. It only now remains for me to pass the dreadful sentence of law, which is that you be taken on Monday next to a place of execution, there to be hung by the neck till you are dead, and your body delivered over to be anatomized, and may God have mercy on your soul. As Bellingham was led out, he simply said, My Lord, and was informed this was not the time to speak. His act was undoubtedly perpetrated with a cool and logical purpose. There had been forethought, and he displayed no real tendency towards insanity. Yet his motives were so perverse, and his mental processes so tangled in relation to this act, one wonders if in today's climate, had he been interviewed by a suitable psychiatric authority, whether they could really determine that this act of protest was the action of a sane man. Dr. Azrini Wadhidin salient throughout the transcript that I read was that Bellingham throughout showed no remorse. Therefore, under the criminal gaze, in theory, he's unable to be rehabilitated. And that is the purpose of imprisonment. So in that sense, he would be placed under the Mental Health Act. And there's no doubt be placed in a secure setting rather than a prison. The law's moved on since Bellingham's time because in addition to the defence of insanity we also now have the defence of diminished responsibility and really we are operating within a very different framework today. A great deal more is known about mental illness. Also the law of provocation has been uh, uh, extended in the present century in ways that might arguably have uh, uh, enabled Bellingham at least to run a provocation defence with what uh, 
hope of success, one doesn't know. Um, it's very difficult to, to compare uh, the, the situation in his day with the situation today. Certainly, mental illness as a factor which either provides a complete defence or at least uh, reduces murder to manslaughter, there's far more scope for that uh, today. Yes, the law has moved on, but I don't know how much the issues of publicity and public pressure that are placed on juries have actually moved on. So I wonder very much just how different the conclusion mm. would have been if it had been even a reasonably popular prime minister.